Um, welcome everybody uh, to tonight's Immunization Coalition uh, webinar on uh, influenza in 2023. My name is Andrew Minton. Um, I work for the Immunization Coalition. I'm quite new. Uh, I'm, I'm responsible for um, the infectious disease education. And um, my responsibility is to expand upon our existing uh, infectious disease education, which we currently do, and also introduce new infectious disease education uh, throughout the year in various different formats, not just webinars, but expert panels, hybrid meetings, and so forth. So I think this year is going to be quite an exciting year. And where possible, um, we will try and make those um, for GPs CPD accredited, as we are now a um, RACGP education provider. But we provide balance also in making sure that the education uh, is, is uh, relevant and applicable across primary care. Um, before we start tonight's webinar, I, I would like to uh, acknowledge the, the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, people participating in this webinar. I pay my respects to elders uh, past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections uh, to the island, to the lands and waters of Australia. Um, next slide, please. So I would just like to um, uh, uh, raise the Immunisation Coalition's mission. Um, there are three areas, and that is to protect Australians and the community um, against infectious diseases, so that's population health, uh, be a keen advocate for immunisation across all patient groups from infants, children, um, uh, adults, and the ageing, and to promote evidence-based scientific information, uh, informed medical information. Uh, just a bit of housework. Um, um, please uh, type in your questions uh, for the speakers in for the speaker in the Q and A box, uh, which is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please don't type in your questions into the chat, but you can use the chat for comments, and that's fine. I will pick up these questions at the end of uh, the speaker's presentation and put those speakers to the speaker, uh, put those questions to the speaker. Um, for certification, um, all attendees will be provided uh, a certification of attendance, and this will be emailed to you in the coming weeks, but you do need to stay online for the duration of the meeting. Um, a recording of this event and speaker slides will be available on the Immunization Coalition website uh, probably next week. Um, so if you miss anything, you can go in and uh, have another look. Next slide. Uh, so um, in order con to conduct the poll, uh, we would like you to indicate uh, your profession, um, which mostly, which uh, uh, closely represents in um, which you would choose the GP or medical practitioner, the nurse, midwife, immunization practitioner, a researcher, a pharmacist, uh, another type of health care or other. Just waiting a few minutes for that to be complete.
Okay, next slide, please. Okay, trying to get to the next slide. Okay, uh, into our speaker tonight. Uh, um, her name is uh, Angela Newbound. For some of you, um, you will know her quite well. Uh, Angela um, is an immunization education consultant based in South Australia, and she is a valued member of the Immunization Coalition. Uh, she's been involved in uh, immunization program delivery in South Australia for over 20 years uh, and provides clinical advice support and the education and education to a wide range of providers across South Australia. Angela also contributes uh, to the development uh, of immunization resources to assist providers with challenging aspects of the immunization program. So without further ado, because there's quite a few slides to get through, um, Angela will speak for about 45 minutes, leaving us 15 minutes of Q&A time. I'll hand over to Angela uh, to take us through uh, what is an important and timely topic uh, of influenza leading into the flu season. Angela. Thank you very much for that introduction, um, Andrew. I, I really um, appreciate the opportunity to present tonight and I'd like to acknowledge that I'm actually presenting from Adelaide. So I'm on the lands um, of the Ghana people, and I certainly pay my respects to all traditional custodians from across Australia and acknowledge and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So, of course, what is influenza? You know, it's uh, this is an interesting topic every single year, and we do get lots of people coming on board to have a quick update, but it's just timely to remind people about influenza. And we know that it's a, you know, these influenza viruses are really a, a significant human respiratory pathogen. And they cause both um, seasonal as well as endemic infections and periodically um, and unpredictably a pandemic. So most people that get the flu, of course, will recover um, quite well within a few days. It might, um, you know, maybe up to a couple of weeks. But some people will develop complications such as pneumonia as a result of the flu, and sometimes that can be life-threatening to them. Sinus and ear infections really are um, examples of moderate complications to flu, um, but of course things like pneumonia and particularly secondary bacterial pneumonia um, are, can be quite serious. Other possible serious complications that um, are triggered by flu is inflammation of the heart or myocarditis. Um, there can be some um, inflammation of the brain, which is encephalitis, definitely of muscle tissues. So you get a, um, a myositis and multi-organ failure um, is also possible. So respiratory and kidney failure. And certainly there's been a systematic review of published studies that describing the relationship between viral shedding and disease transmission. And it was undertaken by Petrosio and Mermel in 2014, which found that one in three influenza infected individuals is asymptomatic. So disease can look very, very different in each individual. So hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, um, they're really important proteins on the surface of the virus. So hemagglutinin um, is a um, antigenic glycoprotein, if you like, on the surface of the influenza viruses. And it plays a crucial role in the early stages of virus infection. And it's responsible for binding the virus to the cell receptors. So all of our cells, um, the HA or hemagglutinin protein helps that um, virus to bind to our cell surface. It then, um, through membrane fusion, mediates the release of the viral genome into the cytoplasm. In other words, that gelatinous liquid that fills the inside of a cell. Neuraminidase protein is produced by various mucosal pathogens and is considered to be 
a virulence factor in that it modifies the host's response to infection. It's crucial for the viral entry into the host cells in the early stage of infection, and it facilitates the release of those newly formed viral particles from infected cells. And so together, these proteins can really facilitate that gliding and crawling motion of influenza viruses on the host cell surface to increase the viral entry into cells. So we've got a few polls tonight during the presentation just to keep you all awake and to keep you engaged. And this is our first poll. So what best describes antigenic shift? It's either a random genetic mutation of an infectious agent resulting in minor changes in proteins called antigens, um, or is it the accumulation of a series of minor genetic mutations? Or is it viruses that are closely related to one another, um, which can be illustrated by their location close together on a phylogenic tree? Or is it an abrupt major change in an influenza virus result resulting in a new hemagglutinin and or hemagglutinin and neuraminidase proteins in influenza viruses? So we're going to give you a few little seconds there just to choose either A, B, C or D. So we'll see how you go. Everybody's thinking about it. And when you feel ready, Joanna, you can show us the results. Ah, so we're a little bit across the board, aren't we? But the majority of you, 60% of you, have got D as the correct answer. So antigenic shift is a little bit a bit different than antigenic drift. So the shift is an abrupt major change um, in an influenza A virus. So that's what's likely to cause a pandemic, whereas antigenic um, drift is just a slight change um, over the course of one season to the next. So um, influenza viruses generally um, are classified, you know, A, B or C, influenza A and B viruses are clinically important in causing human disease. And it's these two surface proteins of hemagglutinin and neuromilidase um, that play that really important role. So there are 18 hemagglutinin and 11 neuraminidase subtypes known to exist. And it's these subtypes that give us um, the subtypes that we see known as H1N1 or H3N2, et cetera. So both of these influenza A and B viruses undergo changes, although B disease does not tend to change anywhere near as much or as significantly as influenza A viruses. So they change these surface proteins um, and they sort of just sidestep then the, um, the immune system. And therefore uh, it tricks our immune system into thinking that it's never seen this virus before, or it might have seen it before and it can kind of remember it and mount an immune response. So most viruses that cause respiratory tract infections, including influenza, of course, infect the epithelium of the upper airway via exposure to um, infectious droplets or, um, you know, self-inoculation, which is, you know, where you've touched a surface, for example, or you've got contaminated hands. And when we talk about touching surfaces, 
Um, influenza viruses have been isolated um, from, you know, more than half of the surfaces inside a home during influenza season. So it tends to leave its mark quite significantly. Symptomatic individuals might experience really sudden onset of high fever and um, potentially a runny or a stuffy nose, um, cough, headache, um, just feeling really quite unwell. And certainly that inflammation of the upper respiratory tree and um, trachea. Some people can experience vomiting and diarrhea as one of their symptoms, though this is really more common in children than adults. Um, so just important to always remember that symptoms vary greatly between patients. So um, not one size fits all. So it is about doing quite a solid clinical examination on patients. So complications of influenza are something that we do need to worry about. And we know that flu viruses um, infect the respiratory tract that can trigger an extreme inflammatory response in the body. And this inflammatory response can lead to sepsis. Um, obviously, that's life-threatening to, um, to people. Obviously, it can make chronic medical conditions worse. For example, people with asthma might experience asthma attacks while they're having the flu, and people with chronic heart disease may experience a worsening of this, con this condition triggered by influenza. We know that respiratory infections such as the flu might um, be an immediate precursor to stroke and myocardial infarct. And according to the American um, CDC, among adults hospitalised with flu during recent flu seasons, heart disease was one of the most common chronic long-term conditions. About half of adults that were hospitalised with flu had heart disease. And studies have shown that flu illness is associated with an increase in heart attacks and strokes. And a 2018 study actually found that the risk of having a heart attack was six times higher within a week of a confirmed influenza infection. And so these findings were most pronounced for older adults um, and especially in those that were experiencing their very first heart attack. Um, a study undertaken in 2018 by Baum and colleagues suggests that influenza-like illness patients are at greater risk of having a stroke within 15 days of their um, influenza-like illness event and remain at higher risk for as long as 60 days. Um, however, the stroke risk itself remained for as long as one year post-influenza infection. So it is so important that this discussion is had with patients that are refusing flu vaccines because they don't think that they will benefit from them. So if we look at the burden of disease in Australia um, in 2022, for example, the influenza data confirms what other studies have shown. And in 2022 in Australia, children aged five to nine years had the highest influenza notification rates during the reporting period, um, followed by younger children um, that were less than five years of age. The notification rate last year was lowest in adults 70 to 74. But of the 1,832 patients with confirmed influenza that were admitted to Sentinel hospital sites, 55.8% of them were children aged younger than 16 years. We know that this is an exceptionally expensive disease with the number of GP visits and ED presentations and hospitalizations. Um, so we need to really reduce the amount of disease burden there is in the community. Our health systems are crumbling. They are really not coping, particularly while COVID is still circulating. But the indirect burden of influenza, such as that societal impact um, of parents having to stay home with sick children or parents that can't go to work or people that do go to work with influenza that don't perform to their top of the game. It's all that lost productivity. None of that is calculated in the cost-benefit ratios 
um, and yet they are really, really important factors each flu season. So if we're looking at Australia over 20, uh, 20 and 2021, these were sort of in our pandemic years, you can see that there was an absolute significant reduction in cases that were reported. And often that is, you know, accounted, you know, obviously to those border closures, you know, staying at home orders. So all of those um, COVID avoidance measures that were introduced. But certainly in 2022, once those um, COVID avoidance measures started to become re relaxed, uh, masks weren't required and our borders um, became open, then we certainly saw a surge in influenza notifications. There were probably some likely other factors at play as well. You know, maybe people didn't bother getting vaccinated in these two, you know, flu-free seasons and therefore previous immunity and lack of boosting to, to influenza um, may have you know, really significantly increase these cases. And, you know, immunity would have waned if they weren't getting their, their natural boosting or their vaccines. And maybe parents didn't even bother vaccinating their little infants and young children. So we ended up having an extremely flu naive population that was at risk of disease um, in 2022. So this is our second poll um, that uh, involves you as a healthcare worker, really. So if we look at international studies and um, reveal that healthcare settings have some of the highest rates of sickness, presenteeism, this is going to work sick. What do you think was the percentage of healthcare workers in Australia that have admitted to going to work sick um, with an influenza-like illness? Do you think it's A, 40%, B? a mere 25, significant 60% or an astronomical 75%? Keen to hear your thoughts. Everyone's still thinking. Couple more seconds. Okay, let's see the results, Joanna. Ah, oh, look at that. It's kind of a little bit across the board, isn't it? All right. So the actual answer is 60%. So it's actually C. So 60% of healthcare workers have admitted. Um, but however, that number jumped to 99.2% for healthcare workers um, when experiencing just minor flu symptoms, including a cold or a sore throat or just feeling a bit flat, maybe sneezing, maybe just a runny nose. Um, so almost all healthcare workers have gone to work while they haven't been 100%. But hopefully, you know, um, and, you know a positive with COVID maybe is that healthcare workers now are a little bit more tuned in into the dangers of going to work if they are not well and perhaps are more inclined to stay home. So who is at risk? Um, in 2019, you know, there were 905 influenza associated deaths. Um, we see some deaths every year. We didn't see any deaths in 2021. We, we really didn't see very much flu at all. You know, 308 deaths reported in 2022. And I, and I hadn't heard of any influenza related deaths this year, but I was talking to Joanna at the coalition just before the start of this webinar. And apparently there has been some recent reports of some influenza deaths coming through. So it'll be interesting to see um, those reports. But we just know that the number of influenza associated deaths reported to the National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System does not represent the true mortality associated with influenza. Um, but this will really depend on how the death was coded at the hospital. Um, was it coded as a stroke or was it coded as a heart attack? 
Um, and we definitely know that both of those conditions rise significantly during flu season. So we would expect that um, the death rate would be higher. And modelling would suggest that it's around about 2,800 deaths per year from um, influenza um, disease. So if we're looking at our risk people, so our um, individuals over 65 um, are definitely at greater risk of serious complications from the flu um, because our immune defences become weaker with age. And this is called immunosenescence, which just refers realistically to the age-associated decline of the immune system that contributes to the increased incidence and severity of infectious diseases and possibly certain cancers in the elderly. As we age, both our adaptive and innate immune systems tend to um, lose efficacy over time and leading to really um, a difficult um, way of you know, trying to mount immune responses against new pathogens. So our adaptive immunity, of course, is responsible for the immunologic memory um, and if that's affected, well, it's a well-known consequence then um, of this is the decreased efficacy of vaccines in the elderly. Um, older Australians are more likely also to have chronic medical conditions as well, which, which contributes to their risk factor. So Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are disproportionately affected by the flu, um, contracting it more often and experiencing more severe forms of the infection than non-Indigenous people. They have high burden of heart and kidney disease and other health related and societal impacts that contribute to their risk for influenza complications. And zero studies conducted to determine H1N1 um, during 2009 pandemic in the Northern Territory, estimated that 22.9% of the Indigenous population in the region experienced infection, compared to only 12.4% of non-Indigenous population. And furthermore, hospital admissions for H1N1 in the top end region were 12 times higher for Indigenous persons compared to non-Indigenous Australians. So it's so important for clinicians to ask every patient, do you identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander? Because if you do, you are eligible for a free flu vaccine and we want to protect you as much as we possibly can from influenza. So who else is at risk? There's quite a list here. Um, so really anybody that's six months of age or older that has a chronic condition that predisposes them to severe influenza. So we've got cardiac disease and we've got chronic respiratory disease, other chronic medical conditions that require follow-up um, often or hospitalisation such as your diabetes, your chronic renal failure, etc. When it comes to severe asthma, a lot of clinicians get confused and um, are unsure of what that means, but severe asthma is defined by the fact that symptoms and or exacerbations remain uncontrolled despite addressing all of the potential contributory factors such as in inhaler, technique, um, adherence to their medications, any other risk factors um, and all of those trigger, other triggers and comorbidities. And these patients are usually on multiple medications to manage their asthma and require frequent follow-up care. So if you've got somebody that says, oh, yes, I need a ventil and puffer after I've run around, you know, the, the oval, that is not severe asthma and they do not qualify for free influenza vaccine. So our list um, continues of people who are at risk of complications of influenza infection, such as our neurologic conditions, liver, chronic liver disease, impaired immunities, so your cancer patients or your HIV patients, um, pregnant women, um, our little preterm babies, definitely ch young children on long-term aspirin therapy, individuals with Down syndrome, as well as obesity, which is a BMI of greater than 30. 
So it's been shown that obesity impairs immune response to influenza and influenza vaccination um, through alterations of the cellular immune system. So compared with vaccinated healthy weight adults, vaccinated obese, obese adults have twice the risk of influenza or influenza-like illness. Um, even though they may have um, slightly, you know, reasonably similar re serological responses to vaccination. There was some research done by Louis and colleagues um, that did identify that 51% of the 534 adult cases of influenza in California during the 2009 H1N1 pandemic outbreak um, occurred in, in obese individuals, and that's with those with that body mass index of, of um, 30. With 60% of influenza mortality cases happening in obese adults. So it definitely is a disease that we need to be very cautious of um, with patients who are obese. And unfortunately, um, data to date um, does say that there are more obese individuals in our community than healthy weight individuals. So obesity is a big medical problem. So, of course, we've got others to consider, and that's we've already identified those at a specific risk. Um, and we have also demonstrated um, that there is high disease burden in young babies and children. So flu vaccine is recommended for everyone six months and over. Um, also consider people that are in these long-term care facilities. So inmates of correctional facilities and um, aged care environments, because um, you know, they are you know, certainly in those enclosed spaces. Essential workers, of course, speaks for itself. Um, I'm quite sure you're all on board and have your flu vaccines every year, but you know, you're certainly at risk of contracting influenza from influenza positive patients, but you're also at very high risk of transmitting influenza disease to a vulnerable, your vulnerable and susceptible patients. We know that flu travels with travellers and no traveller wants to spend a lot of money on their overseas holiday um, and then spend half of it in bed with influenza. So now we'll take a closer look at influenza infection in individuals with some of those chronic medical conditions that we identified earlier. So influenza affects the vascular system in multiple ways. It's associated with a greatly increased number of pro-inflammatory and pro-thrombotic cytokines. And it causes epithelial dysfunction, which is where there is no heart artery blockages, but the large blood vessels on the heart surface will constrict instead of dilate increasing that plasma viscosity and tachycardia. There's mounting evidence to support, in support of a, a, a significant role for influenza infection in the development of atherosclerosis and the triggering of its complications. Major studies have been done to explain the factors that convert established stable atherosclerotic plaques to become unstable, life-threatening plaques. Acute coronary syn syndromes involve the rupture of these vulnerable plaques, which are usually non-obstructive, but when the surfaces of these plaques do rupture or erode, a thrombotic event will ensure. The mortality and utilisation of healthcare resources associated with flu in uh, is concentrated really in the elderly and those with coexisting disease, such as chronic obstructive airway um, pulmonary disease. Much of the morbidity and mortality associated with COPD are due to acute exacerbations. And these exacerbations can be caused by a number of factors, but the commonest, most common factor um, is infection of the tracheal bronchial tree, and viruses play a big role here. 
there is epidemiological and experimental evidence that viral respiratory infections, particularly those caused by influenza virus, increase the incidence of secondary bacterial infections such as pneumonia. Therefore, um, there is potential for significant virus bacteria interaction in COPD. Um, so we need to be very conscious of these patients that are in your practice. Influenza is among the several potential triggers for asthma. An infection with a flu virus can exacerbate inflammation of the airways and the lungs and not only triggering the symptoms of asthma, but certainly making them worse. Um, you are not more likely to get the flu because you have asthma, but you are more likely to experience um, related complications such as bronchitis and pneumonia and potentially require hospitalisation as a result of that infection. Even people with mild or well-controlled asthma are at high risk of serious health um, you know, and severe asthma, but it's, it's really the severe asthmatics that we are most, most concerned about. So conditions such as bronchiectasis usually produce more mucus than unaffected um, areas of the, the lung, and the excessive production is increased by other insults, including cigarette smoking, um, cigarette expo or smoke exposure, um, and of course, infection. So people with diabetes frequently have other chronic um, diseases such as COPD, um, hypertension or renal disease and put them at high risk for influenza related complications or hospitalization. And diabetes actually puts a person at a greater risk of any kind of infection, whether it's viral or bacterial. People with diabetes, and that's type 1 or type 2 or even gestational diabetes, even when well managed, are at high risk of complications, which can result in hospitalizations and sometimes even death. And flu can make chronic health conditions like diabetes worse. This is because um, diabetes can make the immune system less able to, to fight infection. An acute illness can make it harder to control blood sugar levels and glucose levels can really impact then on the severity of an influenza virus infection. Hyperglycemia um, is certainly related to the worst outcomes in both bacterial and viral infections in diabetics. So looking at um, deaths from influenza in people with diabetes, um, Deepa Sloot and colleagues in the Netherlands review, reviewed some epidemiological data on influenza, pneumonia and mortality and found all excess mortality studies that spe specify for underlying disease list diabetes as one of the major risk factors. So during influenza epidemics, death rates among patients with diabetes might increase by around five to 15% they found. And sort of even in recent studies, diabetes is only preceded um, as a risk factor by cardiovascular disease and, and chronic pulmonary disorders. So it is right up there. So heart disease, COPD, diabetes, definitely your serious chronic medical conditions. Pregnant women um, definitely are at increased risk for morbidity as and death from influenza illness during seasonal epidemics and pandemics. Newborn infants born to mothers with influenza during pregnancy, um, especially mothers with severe illness, are at increased risk of adverse outcomes such as preterm birth, and low birth weight. Infants less than six months old who experience influenza infection have the highest rates of hospitalisation and death of all children. Vaccination with influenza vaccine in pregnancy not only protects the woman, but also the baby. Babies under six months, as you know, are too young to be vaccinated themselves, um, but because they are at such high risk of serious complications um, from influenza, they really do need 
um, mothers to be vaccinated in pregnancy to transfer those antibodies across to the baby to assist in protecting the baby from influenza in its first six months of life. So obviously we did talk about travellers. Um, flu is something that sits on the aeroplane in the seat next to you. Um, the, the borders are once again open. Um, travel is once again happening. And so flu vaccination is definitely something to discuss um, with any traveller that you happen to be talking to. So just to recap, Influenza vaccine is recommended um, for these particular age groups. So handbook is very clear. Have a look at your funded flu program um, and have a look and, and think about those that are not eligible for a funded flu but still be offering influenza vaccination to them each year. So this brings us to our third poll of the night. Um, who's recommended to receive two doses of flu vaccine four weeks apart in the same flu season? So is it children less than nine receiving flu vaccine for the first time? What about those individuals having flu vaccine for the first time post a solid organ transplant or a hemopoietic stem cell transplant? What about women who have received a dose of influenza vaccine already this year? Um, you know, maybe they've come in last week and had a 2023 vaccine, but now they're going to be coming pregnant in May or June. Um, are we giving them two doses as well in the same year? So is it all of the above or is it none of the above? Happy to hear your thoughts. Almost there. And let's see the results. Joanna, if you think we're ready. Oh, very good. Okay, okay. All right. Yes, it is all of the above. So all of those um, listed in A, B and C do receive two doses of influenza vaccine for weeks apart in the same year. So your hemopoietic stem cell and solid organ transplant patients, influenza infection may particularly present with severe disease in these patients. And the main risk for severe influenza infection um, are a shorter time from transplant and the presence of pneumonia. So we definitely need to look at people's history. If you have these patients in your practice, definitely make sure that they are um, vaccinated. If this is the first time they're having flu vaccine post their transplant, it's two doses, four weeks apart. So these are the eligibility groups um, for funded vaccine this year. And this has not changed this year. It's exactly the same as what it was last year. Um, so definitely prioritize these patients and use every opportunity to offer vaccine and or administer vaccine to these individuals because they are eligible to receive funded vaccine because of their significant risk or influenza um, complications should they contract the disease. So this is the big question really is, um, when do we vaccinate? Um, it's a difficult question because it really depends on what the season is going to bring us. Usually our peak flu season in Australia is during August and September. However, in 2019, we had an unusually early start to the season and it just had this steady incline of notifications until we got a peak around about July. So just a little, little earlier. 2020 looked as though we were going to be heading in exactly the same direction, but then COVID came along and with all the COVID avoidance measures, once they were put in place and our borders shut, um, it stopped flu in its tracks. 
But what about this year? Well, we can already see um, notifications are on the rise. Flu is well and truly back with us. And according to uh, National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System data today, as of today, there have been 16,136 notifications of laboratory confirmed influenza this year, compared to only 620 cases at the same time last year. So we are well and truly a hundred times really more, aren't we? You know, we're, we're significantly more. So children aged five to nine um, had the highest rates of influenza, like I said last year. Um, that seems to be what's happening again. So once again, it is our young people under 16 years of age that are having the highest notifications so far. Um, in the zero to four-year-old range, there's been 1,800 cases. The five to nine-year-olds, there's two and a half thousand um, cases. And in the 10 to 14-year-olds, there's about um, 1,500 cases. So influenza does not discriminate with age or gender. So it's just not sick people or old people that contract flu. So please be offering it to flu vaccine to everyone. So it's always recommended to get an influenza vaccine every year. And the vaccine changes each year to best match the, match the latest strains of um, the virus that's circulating. Flu viruses constantly change. And this is referred to that antigenic drift um, in comparison to that antigenic shift that we talked about a little bit earlier. The drift consists of really small little changes or mutations in the genes of the influenza viruses that can lead to changes in the surface proteins, so those hemagglutinin and neuraminidase proteins. These small genetic changes that occur um, in influenza viruses over time usually produce viruses that are closely related to one another and our immune system may recognise them and provide some cross protection. However, the small changes in these um, proteins that accumulate over time may result in viruses that are actually antigenically different, meaning a, a person's antibodies um, bind differently or not at all to that particular virus, resulting in a loss of protection against that um, circulating strain. And so while optimal protection is around three to four months post-vaccination, protection is generally expected to last for the whole season. So if you have vaccine in your fridge right now, put it into people's arms or baby's legs, please. Vaccines do no good at all if they are just sitting in the fridge. So we're looking at um, adverse events. Obviously, we do experience, most people experience these very common and maybe the common um, side effects, but these other rare side effects, you know, angioedema or anaphylaxis really are very, very rare. And the only true contraindication for influenza vaccines is that the person has had an anaphylactic reaction following a previous dose of any flu vaccine or they've had an anaphylactic reaction to a component of the vaccine. We know that people with egg allergy, even egg anaphylaxis, can safely be vaccinated with influenza vaccines in a primary care setting. If there is significant parental or health professional anxiety, you can perhaps get them to wait around an extra 15 minutes and make them sit there for 30 um, just to keep an eye on them, but they can receive flu vaccines um, in any primary health care setting. So composition of vaccine, uh, obviously we've got egg-based vaccine composition, and interestingly enough this year, it's exactly the same composition for the cell-based um, or the recombinant-based vac uh, flu vaccines. So uh, we've got two A strains and two B strains, um, often there's a difference between the viruses between uh, that go into the egg or the cell-based vaccines, and that's due to the platforms that are used 
responding differently to the viruses. Um, growing influenza viruses in eggs may introduce changes to the virus, and that's called egg adaptation. So the viruses that are selected by the World Health, World Health Organization that go into the egg, the egg proteins can adapt the viruses a little bit to suit its own little environment. So when they harvest the virus out of the egg, it's not quite the same as what went into the egg. The cell culture vaccines um, obviously do not require chicken eggs because the vaccine viruses used to make the vaccine are actually grown in mammalian cells. And the cell culture that is used for the cell-based vaccine of, available here in Australia is made in Derby canine kidney cells. So please don't panic with that. that the vaccine manufacturer um, is not out there harvesting dogs or puppies or doing anything to steal their kidney cells. This, this is a, a cell culture from a Cocker Spaniel dog back in 1958, and it is now just an immortal cell line. It's a cell line that has just been kept alive. So they put the World Health Organization recommendations for flu viruses into the mammalian cells. So when they harvest those viruses back out, it really is... Um, an exact match of what went in to what comes out. So we don't have this problem with egg adaptation. So all flu vaccines that are on the NIP are egg-based vaccines. So the cell-based vaccine, which you can see at the bottom of the screen, is flu cell vax quad. It's the only um, cell-based or non-egg-based vaccine that is available in Australia. It's available on the private market. It will retail for around about $40 for the dose. But just remember, anybody that's not eligible for NIP vaccines, um, and if they've got private health insurance, may get a rebate back if they are to purchase a vaccine. And I'll just take a moment to remind people, um, according to the Commonwealth, that the only people that are eligible to receive NIP vaccines are those people who are eligible for a Medicare card. If they are non-Medicare eligible, then they should be getting a prescription and purchasing their vaccines. So there are two enhanced flu vaccines for older people. These are both egg-based technology vaccines, um, but the Fluad quad contains an adjuvant, which is known as MF59. It's a squalane oil um, emulsion that, and don't be scared about that because squalene is a natural product it's in humans it's in plants it's in animals and we obviously um you know can utilize that and excrete it and it's not a problem to to humans so it fluid quad is designed to elicit a better immune response in older populations um flu zone high dose um, is a vaccine egg-based vaccine that contains four times more antigen than a standard quadrivalent vaccine. So most all the quadrivalent vaccines have 15 micrograms of antigen for each of the four strains, whereas flu zone high dose has 60 um, micrograms of antigen per four strains. So Atagi says there is no preference between fluad quad and flu zone high dose. Flu zone high dose, though, is um, registered for people from 60 years of age. So anybody that is 60 years of age through to 65th birthday, you could be offering them, um, talking to them about having a flu zone high dose in order to um, give them that better protection than a standard quadrivalent vaccine. If they are, med if they are um, eligible for NIP fluad quad, you could still talk to them about 
uh, flu zone high dose, but flu, dose, flu zone high dose is only on the private market and it's going to retail for around about $70. So I'm sure most people would probably prefer to have the free fluid quad. So as I mentioned before, there were really high notifications of influenza in young people last year. Um, most of the disease you can see here with those red bars was influenza A, but of the samples that were subtyped, and you can see here um, in the yellow with the H3N2, um, there was more H3N2 disease um, than the other strains. And so this may well have also accounted for the high number of notifications last year, because we usually do see high numbers of notifications um, with a H3 year. So we can have a quick look at this graph. The season um, was early. Uh, last year and of reasonably short duration, um, particularly in comparison to that little um, dotted purple line, which is what happened in 2019. Um, so, as I said, H2N2 was the dominant circulating serotype last year, but it was also the dominant serotype in our previous two severe seasons, which was 2017 and 2019. And seasonal H3N2 influenza evolves really rapidly and it leads to poor vaccine efficacy. Um, and unfortunately, H3s do not grow well in egg culture. Um, and, you know, therefore these, you know, this strain is affected by that egg adaptation. So from here, we can see how little flu has circulated during the past 12 months, um, sort of across the September 22 to November 22. Um, most notifications at the moment that we are seeing are either type one or type B. Um, it's a little early for the WHO to be subtyping. So we don't know whether it's gonna be a H1N1 or a H3N2 season this year. However, what we've seen in the Northern Hemisphere is some countries have reported a H3N2 year predominantly. Others have re reported a predominant H1N1 year and others have reported a predominant um, B Victoria year. So we could see anything um, in effect. Just um, interestingly, though, this is the third year that um, Yamagata B or B Yamagata has not been seen anywhere in the world. So little bit too early to say that it's extinct, um, but it's going to be interesting to watch, wait and see. So these are the um, vaccines that are available and registered for use in um, Australia in 2023. Um, this is taken from the ATAGI statement, so please make sure that you have a copy of it and are aware what vaccines are funded for what age groups and which ones are unfunded. So vaccine coverage um, data on the NCIRS website, um, flu vaccination coverage is less than optimal. If we have a little look at last year's rates, those little bubs that are under, under five years of age, there was a 32.4% uptake. Now these babies are at significant risk and this vaccine is free for them. Those aged between five and less than 15 years of age, only 23% uptake. And remember, the disease rates were highest in these age groups that I've just spoken about, as well as hospitalisations in these age groups. If we're looking at 15 to under 50-year-olds, only 28.7% uptake. 50 to 60 to less than 65s were only 46.1%. Our over 65s always do a little bit better. Um, and we got to 68.9%, but they're funded also to have vaccine, and yet we can't seem to really crack um, really good numbers um, of uptake. So COVID-19, I'm sick of those words and I really want it to go away like all of you do. But if we look at COVID and flu, 
Um, both are contagious respiratory illnesses, no doubt, but of course they're caused by different viruses. And it can be really difficult to tell the difference between flu and COVID by the symptoms alone because some of them have the same types of signs and symptoms. So specific testing is really needed to tell um, what the illness actually is and to confirm a diagnosis. But just remember um, your COVID-19 and your flu vaccines can now be co-administered. If they are not co-administered, there is no um, interval required between the doses. So you can have a COVID-19 vaccine today and you can come back in tomorrow or three days time or seven days time and have your flu vaccine if that's what you wish to do. So this is a really nice chart to direct your patients to. It's on um, the Australian government website. But, you know, certainly we would encourage people in this day and age that if they are symptomatic, that they do get tested so they can see what disease is actually causing their, their symptoms. So you nurses and a lot of a lot of the attendees tonight are nurses and I absolutely take my hat off to, to all of you. Um, as well as your GP colleagues that have worked so hard and the pharmacists and everybody else that's been involved in this program, um, not only for COVID, but also for influenza. But certainly nurses in general practice, you spend more time with your patients than the GP does in most instances, because it's usually the nurse who's attending to the wound care and removing the stitches and changing dressings and undertaking those health checks. So, you know, you're in a prime position to chat to the patient and recommend vaccines to them. And more often, I hear GPs actually say to me that it's actually their nurse that's the vaccine expert in the practice. Um, you are all incredibly trusted health professionals, and we know that vaccine uptake can increase by about 9% if there's a healthcare recommendation for someone to have the vaccine. So even like I said before, for those patients who are eligible for NIP vaccine, they should be given the option of choosing other vaccines that are available, such as the cell-based vaccine. We shouldn't make assumptions that people wouldn't want to pay for a vaccine or that they can't afford a vaccine. Um, and it's only people who have been given choices who are in a position to choose. So it is important that people do have choice. And we know with COVID, um, consumers know that there's choice now for vaccines. No, I want a Moderna. No, I want a Pfizer. No, I want, um, you know, AstraZeneca, whatever. You know, we see that they, they know that they have got choices. So definitely we better quickly wrap up here. So many people are at increased risk. Um, we just know that vaccination is our best strategy to reduce the likelihood of infection, reduce the likelihood of developing complications, and certainly reduce the likelihood of dying from influenza. We want to recommend flu vaccine for everyone over six months of age. We want to normalise it. Um, it's part of that six-month-old vaccination encounter realistically. Um, if... If the vaccine is available and it's and it's not expired, certainly give that vaccine. Um, or you know, if the baby's at six months of age and it's out of flu season, and there's no flu vaccine around. Obviously, put a recall reminder on and suggest to the mum, you know, look, come back in four weeks' time because we'll have our flu vaccine in stock. Because we be, we believe that if a baby has a vaccine, at, a flu vaccine at six months of age. Um, the parent is more likely to continue to have that child vaccinated against flu. So influenza viruses continue to be a major health threat to both endemic and pandemic forms. The rapid, continuous and unpredictable nature of influenza viral evolution makes vaccine strategies and pandemic planning really difficult. So, but in saying this, once again, vaccination is our best strategy um, but it only works if the vaccine is in the person's arm. And use every influenza encounter as an opportunity to discuss other recommended vaccines. So I'm going to leave it there, and I thank you very much for listening, and I hope you've all got one piece of new information, and I'm going to hand back now to Andrew to uh, just close off the session. 
Thanks. Thanks very much, Angela. I mean, that's a wonderful overview, uh, a very important topic, uh, influenza specifically as we head into the flu season. And you are right, we're, we are, um, you know, probably two months ahead of, of our flu season. So we're at 16,000 uh, notified cases as of, uh, you know, today or the last couple of days. And if I reflect back to 2018, 2019, uh, we'll forget 2018 because it, it it dropped off and only 60,000 um, uh, notifications in the year, but 25,000 cases uh, at the same time in, in 2019 culminated in just over 300,000 cases. Last year, we were at 640 cases and that ended up at 235. So it seems like depending on how the flu season pans out and it's a bit unpredictable, um, we, we could be somewhere between, you know, 250, 300 plus thousand cases this year. So uh, we do have a couple of questions. I realize that we're over time to stay with us. My first question, I'm going to ask the first question. <laughs> um, <laughs> if, if, if you've already had uh, the 2022 um, uh, flu uh, vaccine, the flu strain vaccine, um, in, in sort of January and February of this year, um, should you retake and 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 be be revaccinated with the new flu strain uh, uh, over the next couple of months? And if so, how do you recall those patients? And do you just focus on the high risk patients? How would you go about doing that? No, anybody that has not received a 2023 flu vaccine should receive a 2023 flu vaccine. So, yes, some patients may have had a vaccine, a 2022 vaccine back in uh, January or February before they expired, but they definitely need a 2023 vaccine for sure. Everybody. Doesn't matter whether they've got credit medical conditions or not. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question here. Uh, I'll just say that they're anonymous. Uh, for people who are traveling to the Northern Hemisphere who have had a flu vaccine in Australia, any thoughts on whether they should have a flu vaccine uh, whilst uh, they're in the Northern Hemisphere? Yeah, look, it depends on what sort of access they've got to the Northern Hemisphere flu vaccines, to be honest. And it can be a conversation with the GP prior to their travel, if they've had a flu vaccine perhaps now or next week and they're travelling to go home for Christmas, it would be a conversation to be had and the GP would then look at, you know, do they have significant risk factors? How much disease is actually circulating in the Northern Hemisphere? What kind of risk does the patient have? Um, and then potentially um, it would be recommended for travel. Even though it's not a Northern Hemisphere formulation, um, we can't give them a North, Northern Hemisphere vaccine because we don't have them here, but it would be hopefully going to assist in helping protect them. Okay, last question. Um, we know that we can co-administer um, COVID and flu now. Uh, the question here is, are they trialling uh, a combination flu and COVID vaccine? Um, and do you think that would be ready for the next flu season 2024? Yeah, look, that's a really good question. Um, there are many vaccines in the pipeline and one of those vaccines in the pipeline, um, well, several of them that are a combination of flu and COVID. They are currently in phase two and phase three trials. Depending on how far they are into their phase three trial to whether or not we will see them next year, um, might be the following year we'll have to have to wait and see really yeah yeah by the time it gets submitted to tga it goes through the process correct it's, it's a massive process yeah yeah uh all right there's just a, a couple of more things to, to to finish off with and i appreciate it. it's nine minutes over time uh just just to highlight uh that uh for the immunization art prize um, we have received a, a, a number of entries. Uh, we've closed uh, the time on that. Uh, we're looking at those and we're going to announce uh, the winners uh, in due course and we'll uh, communicate that out uh, to all of our members. Um, as part of the immunization action weeks, so the seven, uh, seven diseases over seven days, uh, what I, and awareness 
for each of those uh, in the general population. Um, I want to highlight that we have a free influenza vaccine day uh, coming up on the 28th of April. Um, in, in Brisbane, it's the Brisbane's, Brisbane Conference Centre. Uh, in Sydney, it's the Embassy Conference Centre. And in Melbourne, it's in the Melbourne Town Hall. So that's on the 28th of April. It's a Friday. Uh, doors are open um, uh, to get your free um, vac va vaccination from ages of 18 to 64. Doors open from 10 to 4, and they'll be manned by, by nurses. Um, the Coracle is an, just a reminder, it's an excellent um, COVID risk um, factor calculator, which now includes children. So that's available on our, our website. And the new most smart vaccination tool also available, a very nice tool for um, uh, choosing uh, um, uh, the pneumococcal um, vaccine specific to uh, the patient type. That's available on our website and will be updated shortly uh, to include uh, new vaccines as they come, as they are available, uh, but not yet fitting within the NIP. Uh, the next slide. I think there's one more. Uh, look, again, uh, just thank, uh, first of all, thank you, Angela. It's a wonderful presentation, um, very detailed. Um, I'd also like to thank the audience for those that uh, submitted questions. It's really important that you do that. And uh, thanks for, thank you for the participants for actually joining our webinar tonight. Um, I just highlight that our next webinar is on the 4th of April. Uh, it's at 7 p.m. It's COVID-19 and flu pandemic planning in primary care. It's a panel discussion uh, with two local GPs, uh, Dr. Rodney Pierce and Dr. Peter Eisenberg, and, and, and an international speaker who's come over. Um, so that's a really nice panel discussion. So I, I really um, encourage you to go onto our website uh, or look within the um, immunization uh, weekly newsletters. Uh, we've also publicized it on social media. Uh, sign up for that register and look forward to you joining that. At the moment, we're over 500 uh, registrations. Uh, there will be a short, very short survey coming your way. Uh, you'll probably find it in your inbox at the, at the by tomorrow. Um, we look forward to your comments. It's very important for us to uh, um, for continuous improvement of our education. I look for that. Um, and if you want to suggest any topics or subject areas, that would be most welcome. So in that, we're over time. Again, thank you all. I um, hope you enjoyed this evening and um, good night. Thank you very much. Good night.